But what I thought we'd do this morning is just look a little bit of Scripture. Um, is God feminine as well? That's the thought. We're going to look at some Scriptures about God, the Father heart, the mother heart of God. Um, but also we're going to look at a call for all of our lives. So this is not just a message for mums. There's a call for all of us because it's about how are we building our lives. I'm, not, I'm sure you've seen in the news that terrible accident that happened in George. Um, a five-story building near completion collapsed and trapped all the workers. I think the death toll is up to 15. And what a powerful picture of what happens when we don't build correctly. And that's what we're going to be aiming towards is what are we building our life on? We, what are we building our life on? So when we think of God, and I think my favorite description of God is Father. And I think one of the greatest things I've learned going to Bible school and spending a lot of time in the Old Testament is how strong this motive of God is a father. It's a powerful, powerful, strong father. But God is also feminine. And if you think about it, God made Adam and Eve, right? So who, who gave Eve the mother instincts? Where did her mother instincts come from? Who equipped Eve to be a mother? Have you ever thought about that? That must have come from God, right? God must have equipped her. Um, and we've got these powerful scriptures in, um, in our Bible. So let's just start with Matthew 23, 37 to 39. So here's the context. It's, it's the lament, isn't it? Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and he laments. And these are powerful, powerful words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often when I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Powerful, powerful. That's, that's a heartbroken God looking at Jerusalem, knowing the history, the repeated history of them choosing to go their own way, not follow God's way. He, he just wants to gather them. He wants to protect them. He knows there's a serious consequence coming to Jerusalem. Within 40 years, Jerusalem does not exist. Israel is no longer a country till the end of the Second World War. It, there's a serious consequence, and you've got this heartbroken father. That passage in Scripture, Jeremiah 29, Bryn knows it well. Everybody brings it to Bryn. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you a future and a hope. But the next verse, if you turn to me, if you repent, it's a heartbroken father God talking to Israel who've gone their own way, saying, come back to me, come back to me. So we've got this powerful picture. God is like a, a, a hen. And uh, have you ever seen a hen when they kind of gather the chicks? It's quite a powerful thing, isn't it? Have you ever seen that? And they will, you know, the story is they will die in the fire protecting their chicks. There's that instinct that's there. Another really powerful passage um, that I think of G with Jesus is when Jesus is on the cross now, at the end of the Beatitudes, the crowds were amazed, yes? See, Jesus and God's not interested in people being amazed. He's looking for a few of us that are prepared to leave the crowd and follow him. And, and here we have Jesus on the cross, dying for the sins of the world. There are not many people there. The crowds are not there. There's John, John is there, and the mother, and the Mary. And I just want to read that passage. Now, they were stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Jesus is dying for the sins of the world, but his heart goes out to his mum on the cross. And Interestingly, Jesus does have other brothers, but they're not on the same page yet. So one of the brothers is actually James. That's the book of James, is actually Jesus' brother. He actually becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But at this point, his family's not on the same page. So he entrusts his mother to John, who is probably the most on the same page of all the disciples. He's the only one at the foot of the cross. And when we think of John, we think of the gospel of love, isn't it? John is, for God so loved the world. John is, is the gospel of love. He really gets this. And that is the aim for all of our lives. The ultimate end to becoming a disciple of Jesus is to become a person of love. 
because Jesus was a person of love. That's, that is the end game. Powerful, powerful passage. John 14, 16, Jesus prays, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That's an interesting word, comforter. That's the word parakletos, yeah, one who comes alongside. Now, some people would argue that's a feminine translation. We're not going to go into the ins and outs of that. But comforter, when I think of a mum, a mum is a very comforting person. Who do we run to when, our, when we fall off our bike and sc scratch our knees or elbows? Who do we run to by choice? Mum, isn't it? If my child runs to me and they've tripped up, I normally tell them off, what did you do wrong? Did you have your shoelace? Or why did, any other fathers like that here? We tend to kind of, and I've heard this description um, before about, and it's, it's, it's a bit polarized, and of course different mums and different dads carry different qualities, but uh, a mum helps you deal with your internal world, and the dad helps you deal with the external world. And I know that's polarized, and that's probably non-PC in our modern world, but God has made mum and dad differently, and we need the both. And sometimes a mum has to act in the both if it's a single mum, and God will grace and anoint for that. But there is that picture, and the best person that we go to when we hurt ourselves is mum. Now, the other day, my, my boy fell off a bike. And, of course, I went into the male model, and I wanted to leave him there and go and get the car. But I realized this boy was really traumatized. He did a proper Superman. I was like, actually, I, I need to get someone to pick me up. He needs someone. I needed to be a bit more maternal. I needed to be a bit softer. And here's a message for us dads as well. We, we all need to be a little bit softer. Try a little softer. How, how are you when it comes to trying a little softer? Are we, are we good at that? Um, I was having a chat with a friend the other day, and we were talking about if your kid is playing cricket and they get taken out for a duck, as a dad, you want to say, I told you you should be leaning in, or I've told you about this before. But actually, at that point, your son does not need to be criticized for what he did wrong. Because, of course, even A.B. de Villiers probably got out for a duck a few times in his career. What he needs is, I am really sorry that that happened. I'm really sorry you're out for a duck. Now, everything inside of us, a man, wants to address it, correct it, redress it. And now, that doesn't mean that we can't do that. Maybe we just wait a few days and just say, hey, do you know what happened on the side? Would you like me to help you? I spotted something. It's not easy for us, because as us guys, we want to make solutions. We're always trying to make solutions. And sometimes people don't need solutions, aren't they? They just need to be listened. They just sometimes need to be listened to. They just sometimes need to be listened to. Um, and there's a, an amazing YouTube clip about, you must Google it when you get home. Um, it's about this lady, she keeps snagging her jumpers, and she literally has a physical nail in her head. And they got, her partner, she keeps saying, but you got a nail in the head. And she said, no, it's not about the nail. It's, uh, she just wanted him to listen. Ch check it out, Google it. Maybe we can show it later um, when we're having coffee. And he will send another comforter, a paracletus, an intercessor, consoler. Isn't that, that's a, that's a really motherly word, isn't it? To console, advocate, comforter. So yeah, the, the many people believe that's a feminine kind of noun that, or verb that's used there. There are other adjectives of God that the, the Godhead being described as feminine. And Isaiah talks about as a woman in childbirth, like that cry of, to God. Um, but compassion, and I love compassion. I love that Beryl shared this morning because we were having a time of ministry in our home group. And, and I, I just love it when people are being vulnerable and real and someone just comes alongside and just puts a hand. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful thing when they just come and put a hand and they're just there. Some, sometimes a mum is just someone who's there. Just like with the John and the Mary story. And as we journey with one another, even the other day I found out that Leslie's got three boys. Where's Leslie? She's here this morning. Three boys. She made it. You know, teach us. These guys have got four boys. Liz has got four sons. One of them is here. It's wonderful to have him with us. He's the good looking one of the twin. Um, and I love, I love twins because people often ask twins, don't they? What's it like to be a twin? But then I've got a twin. He says, well, I said to people, what's it like not to be a twin? Because from your point of view, that's all you know, isn't it? We, it's an interesting thought. That was for free. Um, mums. And then there is such a cry, isn't there? We often think about the need for dads, and there really is a need for dads, especially in a country like Africa, 
where sometimes physical fathers are not around. And we do need that powerful statement to be declared. Go on, boiky. We need that kind of, we need men that would believe in this next generation. But we also need the mum to be tender. So I have a mum. Is, is there a picture of my mum? Can we put, put it on the screen? I, I want to tell a crazy story about how, there's my mother. Now, <laughs> I'm not, that could be Ethan or that could be Seth. That's probably Seth. Um, that's my mum. She's actually, she's not like me. She's a quiet, shy, reserved. So she obviously is hating that I got her a Wonder Woman apron for Christmas or whatever it was. But that's my mum. And um, when Ethan was born, I've got a brother that's eight and a half years younger than me. He's quite cheeky. He's a cheeky chops. His name is Gareth. And he would tease my mum um, and call her Granny Ann. Come on, Granny Ann, as in taking the mick out of her because she's a grandmother. Um, and she's relatively young. Um, but of course, that name has become a term of endearment, so we call her Granny Anne. But I want to tell you a story about my mum and how she tried to give me some of the things that we've talked about, comfort, wisdom, and, and kindness. And it's actually to do with my brother. So I was 23, so my brother is eight years. What's 23 minus eight? 15, so he's 14 or 15. Now, when it comes to sport, I'm not the best at hand-eye coordination. I am more of a forest camp. I like to run and, and keep running or walking or crawling. I like difficult challenges. But when it comes to playing snooker, or snooker as we say much, um, or tennis, I'm not the best. I can have a go. My brother was already beating me at snooker when he was kind of like 9, 10, 11. So here we are. I'm, I'm a grown man. I'm 22, 23. Um, my brother's 14, 15. We're playing tennis. In Pontypris, it's one of those concrete courts with that lovely little bits of loose gravel. You know that loose gravel? And it's got one of those wireframe nets, really taut, solid steel nets. Well, not is that the word net? That's what you call it. Um, so, and usually, I actually beat him in a set. I know, I shouldn't. Be, so I do a little victory. Has anyone ever done a victory kind of like celebration? So I, I run as fast as I can. I had to jump over the net. Oof. So, I, well, I tried, tried to jump over the net, but I was wearing, it was very fashionable at the time, those Nike Air things, big boots, big heavy boots. And this is a solid steel, you know, this is a council tennis court, solid steel. I'm running full speed, um, and as I, as I get the maximum height, my shoe connects with the steel cable, and stays there, and the rest of my body at, top, at full speed. Now, God's given us ABS, isn't he? So our arms go out to protect. But I, I, hit, I hit the floor hard, huh? Still have a scar. Um, and I can see blood trickling down my chin. My brother laughs, um, as you do. But then, then I say to my brother, Gareth, you know, we, I, I, I think I need some first aid here. I'm... Who's always hopeful? Us guys are always hopeful, aren't we? Come on, surely some steri strips is all we need. So I go to the International Sign for Help, which is the Red Cross in Pontypris Park, the land of Neil Jenkins. You know, but it's, it's just a council kind of run park, thinking, well, there's a first aid thing. I go there, I said, oh, is there first? Oh, no, there's no first aid here anymore. You're going to need to go to A&E. You're going to need stitches. I'm like, oh, the last thing I need to do now is to go to the A&E, get stitches. So I go there. Obviously, I'm not a threat. I'm not a priority. So I'm there for a while. Um, and then I'll call her Gwyneth. I don't think her name was Gwyneth. The nurse, she must have been well into her 90s or something, is injecting me and she's trying to stitch my chin. Um, well, you couldn't make it up, could you? So, so mum arrives. Mum arrives on the scene. And of course, I get stitched up. I've hit the front, I've, I've done something to my arm, I've got my arm in a sling, I'm stitched up, um, it's about 15 minutes from home, and my mum says, well, are you gonna leave? why don't you leave your car here and then come home and we'll pick up the car tomorrow. I was indignant, it was my first new car. No, I'm going to drive home. So I didn't listen to wisdom. Um, so then I start to drive home with an arm in a sling. And you know when you come to one of those kind of feeder roads, when you kind of got a kind of Look to your right before you go. My neck is stiff now, so I'm a little bit slow turning around. And bam, 
bang. I get rear-ended by a guy in an old banger. I get out of the car with my sling. And I'm not joking you. This is what I'm greeting with. I'm in a sling. I'm greeted with this. A one-legged guy. And he says to me, you shouldn't be driving like that. I said, you shouldn't be driving like that. You could not make it up. But one of the metaphors for wisdom in the Bible, there is a biblical connection, is when we look at the book of Proverbs, isn't it? Wisdom is actually talked about in the feminine, isn't it? Come to her, come buy treasures from her, and you will be wise. That's a constant theme in the book of Proverbs. My, wa- my mom offered wisdom, but I didn't take it. But later on, of course, I'm, I'm an apprentice, I'm an engineer, I have to take a few weeks off work. But my mom also did something very kind. Um, because I was at home all the time, you know, if someone's at home all the time, they can get a bit down if you're an out, out, outside person. And she, mums are the kind of people who come around us and they take us out for a drive and they make us go for a walk. And so these are some of the qualities that we love in you mums and please do it and do it all the more. And we are sorry when we don't listen. But my mum is a very generous lady. She's the kind of lady that pays for the tolls for family behind. You have those kind of family battlers who pays for the bill. And isn't it amazing how much of who we are we pick up from who we are around, isn't it? Our experiences of discipleship, our experiences of parenthood, so much is, impacts us from, from what is modeled to us. How am I doing on this 25 minutes? I've only got four minutes left, but we're getting there. The highest calling, I would say, is to be a mum or a dad. 1 Corinthians 4.15, though you have many counselors or 10,000 tutors, you don't have many fathers. We really do need people who care about us deeply inside and outside. They're not just interested in what we can do. And on Mother's Day, maybe you're already a mum. Maybe you're a spiritual mum. Maybe God's called you to be a spiritual father or a father um, with more softer qualities. Lord, help us all. But who are you called to mum right now? Who are you called to father right now? The final passage I want to look at is, again, words of Jesus. You can't go wrong if you read the words of Jesus, can you? And this is Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It's at the end of the Beatitudes, the manifesto for the kingdom, as some people call it. And this is after all of the blessings are, all of what it's, what is it like to be a follower of Christ? Everyone, this is verse 24, who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. We all know this story. It's the Sunday school story. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. How are you building? What are you building? The interesting thing in in Jesus' parable here is there's two things that are in common to both stories. Both are building. Both have storms. We are all building. You are building your life. Whether you're 20, whether you're 40, whether you're 60, you are still building your life. Did you know that? Intentional is is the word, one of the buzzwords at the moment when it comes to spiritual formation. We've got to be intentional about how we build. We're all building. What type of life are you building? Are you happy with the life that you've built? All building. And it's okay. It's never too late. We never graduate from the school of servanthood. And we never graduate from being a disciple, an apprentice, a follower. How are we building? What's the other thing that's common to both stories? Storms. See, storms come. Who likes storms? Obviously, some of us enjoy them from the physical, but in our lives, we don't like storms, do we? None of us like storms. I often talk and joke with people on the till. I I like to joke and make people laugh. I always say we need to laugh more and cry, you know, because we can't control the crying, can we? Let's be honest, when you get the phone call and your dad's had a big stroke or someone's died, you can't control those moments in your life, but we can choose to build happy, positive memories. None of us like the storms of life, but how are we building the storms of life, they, they reveal, don't they? They reveal what have we built. 
when the worst things happen, when those worst news things happen in our lives, and they come, and if you haven't had any, you will, um, it reveals really, when my dad passed away, it really tests your faith. Do I really believe this stuff about God and heaven? Do I really believe it? It's a real revealer of what's really inside of you. I had the privilege yesterday of going to a memorial. Liz's dad passed away, and we had the privilege of celebrating it at the Church of the Ascension in, in Hilton. And it was a, truly a privilege to go somewhere where someone who's in his 80s has passed away, and I think he'd been sick for quite a while, but yet the church was packed. And he was a teacher at Hilton for 40 years, and an Alexander House before. And interestingly, what he was remembered for was not that he worked in Hilton or this or that, but he was remembered as a person of love. He was remembered for, for a kindness, for inspiring people. The messages from the old boys were not hoorah messages. They were messages of, thank you for making the difference. Thank you for taking time to believe in me, coming alongside me when I was sick, when I was ill. And Liz has had some storms. I can see his name is David Hammond. And listening and knowing a little bit of the story, he had some big storms in life. Um, it's not easy to lose your wife to cancer, I presume. Not, not easy, is it? It's, it and, and to get remarried. But the, the common thread was love. The common thread was his faith. They kept talking about his faith. And he brought his faith into, into his world. How are you building? What are you building? Are you stormproof? Now, we all need help, don't we? But I just, I just want to provoke us all, and, and maybe, maybe just 25 minutes is gone. Just take a few minutes just, just to zoom back and just ask God just to speak to us from his word. Lord, we do thank you for the privilege of life. We thank you for the life that you've given us, the people that we get to journey with. Thank you that you've invited us to be your disciples, to be your followers. Lord, we want to be intentional about how we build. We don't want to think it's too late. We want to be people who become like you. Because what you get out of our lives is the people we're becoming. That's what we take into eternity. We don't take properties or investments. What, what, what you get from our lives and what we get from our lives and what our loved ones get from our lives is the people that we're becoming. And we want to become more like you. We want Jesus, we want you to be Lord in our lives. Not just in a Sunday when we're together. We want you to be our, our Lord when we're in the queue or when we're frustrated or when, when we're in a difficult situation. Holy Spirit, would you just help us? We thank you that you invite us. We thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and that we can come to you. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, that you are our comforter. And that you, you want to be in every aspect of our lives. As we leave here, as we talk, as we celebrate, as we meet, meet with friends or family or whatever we do today and into this week ahead. We just want to say, Jesus is Lord. We invite you to be Lord of our lives. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. We want to be more aware of you. We want to just stop and listen. And Would you help us to build lives that can stand the storm and prepare us for eternity with you? In Jesus' name, amen.